Hi, my name's Chaz Newby. I used to play bass with the Beatles for a short time, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show that centers on what's going on in the world of the Beatles news-wise. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show. Many of you know me for another program that I host on the Beatles called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my co-host, who writes for Beatles Examiner, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. On today's show, we have... A very special guest, and um, he actually uh, was uh, touring with the Beatles during the uh, 1964 and 65 American tours, and he's written a number of books on the group, and he has a brand new one called When They Were Boys, and we welcome Larry Kane to Things We Said Today. Welcome, welcome, Larry. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Larry, uh, before we talk about the book, just to give people uh, some background information about you, how was it that you came to cover and travel with the Beatles for well, uh, their first two tours? It was 1964, and I was a news director for a station called WFUN, which stands for fun, in Miami. We had four people on the, on the staff, and it was a big year. The Cuban refugees were coming from Cuba to settle in Florida. Uh, Muhammad Ali won the title championship right down the block from us. The war in Vietnam was escalating. There was a new president in the aftermath of the assassination of President Kennedy. And the Beatles came to Miami Airport uh, after the Ed Sullivan show, and there were 5,000 people there, and they blasted out the windows of the airport. But I didn't think too much of it. After all, this was a mop-top band, as they were called, uh, and uh, nobody really quite understood what was going on. I did a brief interview with them at a hotel in Miami Beach. I saw them the following Sunday for the second Ed Sullivan uh, insert, and then that was that. Around March, uh, the station asked me to send out a letter, and I'll make it brief, uh, to, uh, to ask Brian Epstein, their manager, if I could interview them one-on-one -on -one in Jacksonville, the closest place they were coming. And basically, I wrote a, a long letter, sent some fan mail with it, and they wrote back inviting me on the tour for the cost, journalist cost, $3,000, which would be $90 a day, uh, 26 cities, 34 days, uh, about 30-something concerts with the double concerts. And basically, with all that stuff going on, I told my boss to send the DJs. And he said, no, we want you to go because we want the news every day and a fresh approach. And I said to him, now, wait a second. You and I both know that this group, the Beatles, they're going to be here in September and gone in November. <laughs> that just shows you guys. What an extraordinary journalistic visionary I was. Mm. So, so I, went, <laughs> I went to travel with them. And uh, about uh, three days into this, I said, my goodness, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And not just the craziness that you read about, that you won't read about in my books, but uh, the late night stuff and everything that was happening, but the insanity of the, of the fans, the adoration. Because in the first phase, a lot of people don't realize this, in the first phase... It was all about adulation, uh, admiration, love, passion, and appetites. And the next phase, a couple of months later, was, wow, is that music incredible or what? Hmm. Yeah. So initially, you didn't think much of their music? No, it wasn't that I didn't think much of their music. I didn't understand their music. You know, I thought, well, I Want to Hold Your Hand was a nifty song, and Please Please Me and Love Me Do. Uh, but I didn't really understand. Did I know? in September or August of 1964, that they were going to be the greatest band of all time, the tightest band of all time, produce the most amazing, extraordinary music with such a, a range that nobody could believe that anybody could do that. No, I didn't. If I knew that, I would have uh, took, taken all of my bar mitzvah money and uh, purchased a uh, nice camera. <laughs> <laughs> instead, of, instead of this little uh, uh, Instamatic that I had. Right. So tell the folks what it is about this new book, When They Were Boys. Well, the, what, the trip that I took with the Beatles uh, that I portrayed in Ticket to Ride was a thing that I experienced. The Lennon book was a thing that I experienced. Th 
this was quite different. Uh, I was always interested in how they got started, but not necessarily the pablum they had when they were kids, but how they really got started and what really happened. And what I attempted to find and what really what I discovered were two totally different things altogether. First of all, I did not realize uh, until I went to Liverpool so many times and until I started interviewing people who knew them and were with them, what an extraordinary support team they had. The 15 or 20 people who still meet today and have their birthdays together and celebrate special life cycle events uh, who are basically I, what I call left behind. Uh, I never knew that they almost quit so many times. I never realized that despite legend that they really didn't get along as well as people thought they got along with in the early teenage days. And then I began to realize we were talking about teenagers. And you know what high school's like. George Harrison is 17 years old, so according to the ones who are 19, 20, and 21, he's certainly not as mature nor not as well accepted by the boys. I never knew about the Pete Best story and really what happened to Pete Best. And I never, and I never, certainly never knew that a lot of the interviews I had from 1964 and 65 related to events that occurred in the early 60s and late 50s. So I took out all my tapes, my 25 hours of tape, I listened to it, and I started to piece it all together. And it becomes, uh, you know, Bill Harry calls it a page turner. I call it a, uh, it feels like a novel, but it really happened. And Steve, Ken, you and I, all three of us could sit down, and we could never have made this story up. You couldn't, you couldn't make it up. It's a very, it's a very human story. That, that's the one thing that that uh, that I got as I you know, as I read the book. Uh, how human it is. Uh, it's not a, it's not a novel. It's not a. You, you don't romanticize the story, which is, you know is really rare in Beatle books. And well, that's, in, in there, in there, some people accuse me of liking them too much, but I can't help that. I just did. But in but in in this book, as in a few other books around. This is the real story, and this is not a romanticized, glamorous story. I mean, when these boys uh, were uh, very young, they were cleaning the toilets of the uh, Jacaranda in Liverpool. Uh, they were doing anything they could to get a chance to even get a stage to perform on. When John Lennon was a, a little boy, he was also a milk delivery man, and he would wander the streets of, of the city and think about how he would torment his teachers, and he did a very good job of tormenting his teachers. In fact, his principal, Corey Bank School, told him he would fail. And John Lennon didn't like to hear that. John had a tortured life uh, in terms of his childhood. And uh, the family story of John Lennon's family, the fathers, the mothers, uh, the surrogates, uh, the story of uh, Paul McCartney's tragedy and John's tragedy, both of them two years apart, losing their mothers in their teenage years, one to cancer, the other to a hit-run accident. Uh, the the, romant, the romanticizing of things that happened to them that really weren't very, very romantic. I mean, to me, honestly, the four of them going to Hamburg was like uh, almost a, a form of uh, older child abuse. I mean, they were they were uh, living in bathroom environment. They were being beaten by thugs and wanted them to perform extra hours. So who do they call on to help them? You 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 know all the names, hmm. but the, the general public does. Horst Foscher who was a convicted killer, and helped them get through the night, as they would say, as uh, John would say with Elton John, <laughs> whatever gets you through the night. And they barely got through those nights. They were embarrassed in Hamburg. I mean, John, Paul McCartney and, um, and uh, Pete Best were uh, almost arrested, actually detained, were allegedly, and I say allegedly because there's no, quite, no doubt that they weren't responsible, for setting a fire in a stage curtain. Uh, George was uh, unceremoniously deported because he was uh, underage. And John just got out on his own. I still don't know exactly how he sneaked out. And, of course, uh, the, the saddest story of all, uh, Stu Sutcliffe, who fell in love, had the love of his life, and later died from some things that happened to him. So there's a lot of that. And there's also the people, by the way. I'm not, I don't mean to talk ad nauseum here, but I mean people like Sam Leach, who sits in a bar, on Matthew Street in a place called The Grapes, where the Beatles got together, or Grapes, and tells his story and sells his books, maybe has a beer if he's healthy enough. And people like Frida Kelly, I'm sure, if you 
had to talk to Frida Kelly this year. We have. And, um, and uh, I was, I'm proud to say I was a private, primary motivator for her to come to the United States when uh, she was very leery about it. Uh, people like uh, uh, Bob Wooler, who I never met, who I would have loved to have met, the impresario, the DJ. Uh, people uh, like uh, Sir, Sir James, uh, the counselor from, uh, from Southport, who I met, and, and, the, and the young Ron Watson, who saw them almost 500 times at the Cavern. Uh, he was a young law clerk. And, you know, people who encourage them, and encourage them in a way that teenagers need. When you're a teenager and you're getting started out in life, and I don't care how talented you are, when, when uh, Sam Leach told Paul McCartney and John Lennon and Ringo Starr later, you will be the best, you will be bigger than Elvis, when he told George that, he couldn't believe him. And Sam eventually lost the band uh, to Brian Epstein. And, uh, and that was sad because he did so much for them. So there were, there were a lot of stories. And, of course, Epstein's story himself, which a lot, of, a lot of people don't realize that his sexual preference at the time was against the law in England. Mm-hmm. So he mm-hmm. was hiding. He had this big secret, and he was working with four most heterosexual human beings on the planet, uh, which is, by the way, very accurate, a very accurate description. And, <laughs> and you know, it was a very, very odd mix, but... You know, they're all great memories, and uh, I was able to put the memories. That, so this story, unlike Ticket to Ride and the other, was total um, uh, journalism from the standpoint of getting the own, my own story, not just reading. I had to read 18 or 20 books, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't just reading the books. It was telling the story in a way that would be clear and understanding to people. I was going to say that um, the Beatles story becomes more fascinating with every passing year, the more that you learn about them. And like you said, Larry, they had a very tough life. And people don't realize that and all the hard work that they put into their act. Um, and you were talking about when they returned from Hamburg in 1960, there was a moment in there where John said to you how depressed he was. He was really down at that time. And that was one moment when they could have broken up. Well, they actually broke up. I counted it, if you really want to be official about it. They actually broke up on seven different occasions. But breaking up as a teenage band is not the same as breaking up in 1969 and 1970. Hmm. There weren't legal disputes or money disputes. Uh, the reason they almost broke up is there, were, there was tremendous pressure from the parents. Uh, George was going to be an apprentice electrician, uh, although his father would have had hoped that he would drive in the bus that he drove all of his life. Paul, uh, at various times, studied to be a truck driver, uh, which never panned out. And Paul was really the most determined, along with John. Uh, Ringo, who eventually joined the band, Came, he was the only one who came from a really poor background. There were no facilities in his house. And he had a mom who, to the day she died, carried a piggy bank just in case, even after he was successful. Hmm. And they had very loving parents, but they were parents like all parents who worry about what their kids are going to do. And I have this sound bite that I can actually send you later if you want to include it in one of your programs of McCartney saying to me in 1964, well, my dad told me uh, that... Uh, I'm never going to make any money this way. And he said I should get a day job. And then he went on to explain how it didn't happen. And uh, isn't it lucky that it did then now, and this is when he was alive, and now he thinks it's the greatest thing I've ever done. But parents can be a very powerful influence on people. And Aunt Mimi, uh, John's aunt, who really brought him up during the formative years, would tell him, uh, you're not going to make money that way. You're not going to have a living that way. So in a way, despite all the discouragement and love that they got, they managed to break through that, and this is a period now from starting with John Lennon in 1954, 1955, through 1963. This is not an, oh, there weren't overnight sensations, and, and even in 1962, when they started to uh, have the manifestation of their writing come true with songs, even then, in 1962, they had problems with record companies, uh, Epstein had to work so hard for them. Uh, they doubted themselves. They got rid of Pete. Uh, there was a lot of combustion going on and a lot of turnover. It was like an engine constantly turning over. And the, the greatest, I will tell you that right now, that I think the greatest crisis they ever had was one that nobody really understands. When Pete left the band and he was forced out, really, by John, by uh, George and Paul and their families, when Pete was forced out of the band, there was a bigger crisis than who would play for the man. That, that turned out to be Ringo, of course. 
But on the day that Pete left, uh, he was very, he was tearful, he was very upset. He walked over to the grapes. Again, the grapes, the, or grapes as they call it, comes into play here, uh, right around the corner. And he, um, he called, he went on the payphone and called Neil Aspinall, who was their road manager. And whatever you want to say about Neil Aspinall, he was as clever as they come. He protected them with iron. I mean, he was just amazing. And he was very, very devoted to Pete's mom because they had a baby together. And, uh, and he was close with Pete as a friend. They were very, very close people. And he said, I'm leaving the band, too. And over a three-day period after his firing, Pete did one thing. You talk about unselfishness. He went to Neil Aspinall and said, don't leave this band. They're going to become big someday. And he talked his best friend into staying with the band that he was upset at for firing his best friend. Neil Aspinall, of course, went on the Beatles tours with us and became the CEO of the Beatles' empire. And so it was, a, it was a very successful arrangement for him and for them, although he might have made one big mistake in his career, and I think both of you might agree with this, he didn't get on iTunes fast enough. <laughs> you know, he didn't want to go with the Apple brand. And I think that probably cost him uh, lots of millions of dollars. That was oh. a very unselfish thing right there that Pete best yeah. did. Well, Pete basically Neil. said to him, and you know, I mean, you, we've all had good friends and relationships. And you know, when something happens to one of your friends, you defend them. And, and you know, I've, I had a, a two very close, really, really, outside of my family, really tight friends. And if something would happen to them, I would do anything to help them. And he, he wanted to quit the group and get the heck out of there because they hurt Pete so much. And Pete said to him, you have to stay with this man. And, and I think that was extremely unselfish, especially for a young man at the age of uh, 20. I mean, for, to have that kind of maturity. And, you know, Pete went through a lot. He went through depression. He became a politician, then learned all about politicians, the corrupt nature of it. He didn't like it. Uh, he then, by the 1980s, formed his own band. And I will tell you something that may surprise a lot of Beatle fans. There is probably as much respect, or maybe more in some quarters of Liverpool, today for Pete Best, who stayed there, as there are for the boys. Oh, yeah, I've talked to, I've talked to people from Liverpool who've, who've said that. that they love uh, That Pete Best is still much, much loved. Um, there's a lot of admiration for him still. That doesn't surprise me at all. I'm talking too much, but remember, you're talking to a broadcaster. So no, 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 that's that's quite all right. I wanted to ask about your portraits of John and Paul from the early days. Uh, and when they became famous, they obviously, you know, they were uh, the basic. They were the basic personalities, and they were di they were somewhat different. I mean, you talk about John, you know, being very honest, and and you also talk about Paul being very driven to become successful. Talk about both of them and how they compared, say, around 1963, how they compared uh, in personality. Well, in terms of the traveling with them, and remember I saw 77 concerts mm -hmm. over two and a half years. The last year I was in the service and I managed to get out, and that's when they both offered me a job to get me out of the uh, Vietnam War. <laughs> <laughs> I declined. Uh, but they were very different. I would say that that John led by um, example and his personality, and Paul led uh, on stage. Paul loved, despite what some people write, Paul loved the stage. He never met an audience he didn't like. Uh, John was less excited about entertaining in public. Uh, but they, their personalities in terms of the way they did things uh, were, were quite different. Uh, John was quieter and only said things when he had something to say. Paul was more of a, um, I, I think public relations is the wrong way to put it, he was more of the showman, okay, more of the entertainer, more of the, I'm going to flirt with the audience. Uh, and, uh, and this is the difference. George and Ringo on the first tours were very quiet, uh, although George would say some things, you know, that were stupendous. When we had an emergency landing of our plane in Portland, he yelled out, Larry, tell everybody if anything should happen to this plane. It's Beatles and children first. I mean, he can make some very funny remarks in the strangest times. But I think something, something that they did have in common. Although they, you know, John could be acerbic. He slapped a reporter once in Kansas City. 
and Paul could be uh, so cheerful. It was kind of, how can anybody be that cheerful all the time? Okay, There was something about them that was amazing. Before all the concerts, especially in 1964, there were a couple of groups. One was called the Exciters. They had a very big hit song called Tell Him. Mm -hmm. Uh, They were from Bronx, New York. Clarence Frogman Henry, um, the Bill Black Combo, Jackie DeShannon. And Mm -hmm. probably the the most important group in terms of music, fourth or fifth of the Beatles during that decade, and that was the Righteous Brothers. And the Righteous Brothers were a big hit team. They had a song called, you know, You've Lost That Loving Feeling. Mm -hmm. They also had Unchained Melody. And we played football on the Jersey Turnpike. As we were going down to Atlantic City, we we took out a football and played a game of catch. And, And they told me they were leaving the tour after Atlantic City because they simply could not take, we want the Beatles. We want the Beatles. Every one of those groups was thunderously, uh, obliterated by the crowd. And these were talented people. And John and Paul did something every night that I will never, ever forget. They would get on the plane. And, of course, they were, you know, de- de- commi- you know decommissioning themselves, defusing themselves from the night, slowing it down. They would get, go to the bathroom, wash up, have a cigarette, a little bit of a drink, and then they would walk to the front of the plane where all those groups were sitting. And every single night, Every single tour event I went to them with, they would kneel down in the aisles and see how everybody was doing. It was almost as though they felt so guilty that other... I mean, this is a mature thing to do. Hmm. This is something I would think Frank Sinatra would do, you know? He would go to the band and thank them. Uh, But these guys would go, are you okay, everything all right? Did you have a good time? Sorry we drowned you out. It was just amazing. And I I found that to be such a touching and human thing to do, but I don't think that would have come from uh, people who were, were uh, heavily invested in by other people. I think it would have had to come from people who had been there for uh, eight years, struggling in uh, little holes in the ground and clubs with 20 people or 30 people and making $8 a concert for all of them like they did at Litherland Town Hall in uh, December of 1960. Uh, I think they would, I, I personally believe, that that kind of nature, that kind of character comes from within, and that they, their willingness to say to them, are you okay, are you doing all right, is everything all right, was their way of saying, we're really sorry that people can't hear your music. Hmm. That's really... Uh, one quick follow-up. You mentioned the, um, the slapping the reporter. I'm curious how that... I don't recall hearing that before, before I read it in the book, and I'm wondering how he got away with that. Well, I'll tell you what happened. Of course, today mm-hmm. it would have been a different world. Right. Um, we didn't report it. I'm going to be very uh-huh. honest with you. In those days, you know, when you were with a celebrity, there was a certain level of privacy. But I did remark, I remarked on the air that he had a, an incident with a reporter. So what she did is she said, are you cheating on your wife? And he slapped her, a very small slap, and walked off. Brian went after him and just got crazy. I have never saw Brian lose his temper. But he was so upset. At him. And then he apologized to the reporter. I was right behind him when he did this. Mm-hmm. I was walking down the steps of the plane. And so I went to the reporter. I said, you okay? She says, yeah, I guess I hit a raw nerve. So I said to him later, why did you do that? And, and he said, and I, I want to bring up another episode that's very interesting here. He said, uh, she asked me if I was cheating on my wife. And I said, why did not you have some fun with her and say, of course, every night, see you later? <laughs> You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And he didn't understand that. Now, there was another episode that came up that people can see on film. In the 12-minute in the film I did with John and Paul in 1968, uh, John was deriding the press for reporting that Paul said he had used LSD. Right. And he thought that it was a criminal act that the press had reported that. And he thought that there was an unwritten rule that you can't say those things. So he said, so we told this to a reporter, and the reporter actually put it on in the newspaper. So that was, to me, a real naivete about the role of journalism. But mm-hmm. look, I saw a lot of things that I will never tell people about, and I'm not saying they were degrading or horrible. They were just single boys with single women, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and I saw a lot of craziness. Did I feel compelled to write about it? Absolutely not. Would I have written about it today if I were uh, working on Entertainment Tonight? Or maybe. 
but that's not the kind of journalist I felt myself to be. And some people would say, well, you didn't do your job. Others people, other people would say, well, if you had reported that, it could have destroyed them, and it could have given them a nasty reputation. You know about the episode in the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas. You know, both know about that? Is that the one where they, uh, they found girls. The, uh, the girls? Uh, yeah, so basically I'm in the Sahara Hotel. I get a knock on my door. I've known these guys for three days. Mm-hmm. And Derek Taylor, the press secretary, says, can you put your suit on? You look like a grown-up. So I said, I don't know, what are you talking about? And he and uh, Aspinall took me down to a lobby with Epstein to convince a woman that her two twin girls, her twin girls were sitting in John's room, and that mm-hmm. nothing happened. And nothing happened. John was asleep there eating popcorn and watching a black-and-white monster movie or something. <laughs> and this woman had been gambling all night, didn't pay any attention, and she eventually sued them. But I went down and defended them. And because I knew that nothing happened in that room, I could tell. Did I report that? No. Did I report that 45 years later? Yes, because I think it showed just how dangerous the situation was. You and I both know that in 1964, if anything had happened with underage people, the Beatles would have been done. Absolutely done. I don't care how great the music was. Don't you agree? Oh, yeah. Right. You know what kind of time we lived in? I mean, it was a very uh, prudish time. It was a racially tinged time. And by the way, it's another thing that blew my mind. When they said to me that they would not play the Gator Bowl if it was segregated in Jacksonville, mm-hmm. I thought that took a lot of guts. <laughs> and, and by the way, it was desegregated for the first time. I was going to bring right. that up to yeah, you. That... How can 22-year-olds, 20-year-olds, uh, 21-year-olds, and, and, uh, and uh, 21 and 20 in George, what kind of a, 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 a base of of goodness did they have to do something like that. For all the stuff being written right now about how wild they were with women, I'll tell you that what they did with women was what any young person would do. You seek them out, you do your thing, you're kind to them. It wasn't like everybody thought some big, gigantic orgy. And I never went into their bedrooms, and I don't know what the heck happened. Yeah, I was in their bedrooms, but not for that. (laughs) (laughs) I went fishing with them in Seattle from their bedrooms, and I would uh, occasionally play Monopoly. Yeah, that's an interesting thing about the um, the Gator Bowl incident. And you bring up in the book how Paul, as far as black people are concerned, he was just, he didn't see any difference between black people, white people, and he treated it that way, and, and the Beatles supported this a cappella band called The Chants that were an all-black band. And... Uh, actually invited them to, to appear at the cavern. Well, it's one of my favorite stories because I'm trying to figure out how guys who lived in a racially tinged town, a town of anti-Semitism, Catholic and Protestant divisiveness in those days, how they overcame that. And to me, when uh, Joe Anker came along with his band, uh, which was uh, uh, a doo-wop band without musical accompaniment, and they, they walked them into the cavern. It had to be shocking to the people there. I mean, a black group had never been on a public stage in Liverpool before. And when they when they introduced him to Little Richard, it was one of the highlights of of Joe's life. Hmm. And and when he when you, you you listen sit and listen to this man talk about that and what he did for them, what they did for him, and the way blacks were treated there and of course elsewhere around the world. It's pretty amazing. And the interview with Paul is a really awkward interview where he says, of course, remember the word Negro was used in those days? Right. Right. So it was standard operating procedure. And he said, it's just like going to a country, and you get a tan and you get dark. Are those people any different? You know what I mean? And that was his way of sort of explaining it. And it it was a very simplistic but honest way of looking at this racial tension that still exists, of course, in this country uh, in a different way now. But uh, I I thought that they were extremely mature, and uh, to have gone to that point and not to see to be colorblind for their young lives was amazing because the parents, and I'm not going to go into great detail here, but the parents were not that way. Mm. Interesting. Because I was just going to suggest that because they were being from Europe, it was a little different situation rather than, I mean, if they'd been American, you could have understood or you could have uh, not understood, but I mean, you could have seen the, you know, the because of the racial situation here, and I, I didn't 
think maybe it was the same in Europe, but I guess I guess it was. There's a wonderful picture uh, the, of the Beatles and uh, yours truly in the Comiskey Park White Sox locker room hmm. in Comiskey Park. And if people look closely, they get a real kick at it. We're sitting around, and John's wearing his beret, and he has a magazine. It's Ebony Magazine. Mm-hmm. This is 1965. That's right after the riots in Detroit. Mm-hmm. And the magazine, if you look closely, the, the headline is The White Problem in America. Oh, my. And it's interesting how some people have noticed that. Not many. But that was his way of getting that message out. And uh, to me, I mean, look, there's a lot of contradictions in their point of view on peace and love. But the truth of the matter is that in England, you could buy your way out of the draft. Okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, and there's, there's a little bit of hypocrisy there. But for the most part, they all really believed it. And they really, you know, this was not just uh, adapting themselves to a cause celeb. This was how they really felt. And we were, you know, going through the throes of war in Vietnam. And they never understood the assassination of the president here. In fact, uh, Rolling Stone just did a, a piece on um, on the anniversary, and they took some quotes from uh, uh, my interviews on with Paul talking about Kennedy. Just didn't understand that, and it's kind of ironic that I, uh, when I interviewed uh, John and Paul in 1968, it was right after the Martin Luther King assassination, and I said. Just innocently, I said, well, what was your reaction? And John spit, fired back, what do you think, Larry? Assassination is a terrible thing. Nor did I ever really ever connect that to what happened mm-hmm. 12 years later. But um, it's, uh, it's interesting to see people live within their times and make the impact they have. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting also that I didn't want to go which is proof positive that uh, for a young journalist as a reporter uh, never turned down anything. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting that the Beatles took a chance there in 64 with the segregation issue. I mean, it was their first year breaking big in America. Excuse me, Ken, I'm sorry. I'm saying it's interesting that the Beatles actually took a chance and took a stand against segregation in 1964. It wasn't I mean, very they... popular. Okay, their fans were all over the country. and uh, But they did it, and they also did something else that was, uh, I believe, uh, really startling. And a lot of people don't know about this, but uh, in Key West, the reason they went to Key West, Florida, was because of me. It was quite by accident. We were in Montreal, and there was a hurricane, Hurricane Dora, Hmm. off the Jacksonville coast, and they wanted to go to Jacksonville early before their concert there. That's the Gator Bowl concert that I wanted to really interview them at. And um, they couldn't because of the hurricane. So on the airplane, Brian Epstein came over to me and said, well, you're from Miami. Do you know any places in Florida where no one will show up at 4 o'clock in the morning? And I said, actually, I do. And uh, we found a hotel called the Key Wester, which is in the heart of Key West, and we landed there at 3.45 in the morning. And the mayor and his two teenage daughters were there. <laughs> and uh, we went to Key West, and I made a deal with them that I would not release the story of them being in Key West until 1 o'clock the next afternoon. So at least that day they wouldn't be bothered. By the second day, it was insanity. And um, it was uh, just beyond belief. But uh, So we went to Key West. And in Key West, John Lennon did the unthinkable. Not to me. He went in the pool with the exciters. Oh. Hmm. Three uh, African-American women from New York City. And you should have seen the reaction in the South. It was unbelievable. You know, this is, I mean, I know it sounds, well, 1964, it was still there. All that hatred. Lennon swims in pool with Negroes. Was that reported in the papers? Oh, yeah. Oh, it was all through the Southern it. papers. Larry, uh, in the book you talk about Pete Best and you, you know, how much uh, you, you liked his drumming. And you also seem to go to the uh, theory that Mona Best was a, a good part of the reason that they kicked him out. Is that uh, talk? Let's talk about that. Why do you think he got kicked out? Well, she, first of all, she insulted George one night, and uh, she was a very strong-willed woman. She was probably a woman, you know, forty years ahead of her time in terms of uh, being liberated to to work hard. Um, she was very clever. Uh, 
Uh, she was, I, I often call her the den mother of the Eagles because she hosted them so often. Mm-hmm. And uh, even when their families didn't want them out playing, uh, she was very, very supportive of her son, who came into the drumming business by accident. He was just part of their nightclub there. And um, he, she was getting kind of forceful. But she was also making some very powerful recommendations to Brian Epstein. She was telling him to go to the cavern. And it's my view from, the, from talking to Bill Harry and some of the people there that she had a lot to do with getting them into the cavern, even though her little nightclub, the Casbah, was the first place they really performed in a club club. So there was that, but there was also something else. The something else was that from uh, late 1960, when the Beatles were hardly known, to the, almost the middle of 1962, when they're getting very well known, and the seminal year of late 1960, the late 1961, the Beatles, Pete Best was the most popular Beatle in England. That is borne out by magazine covers, by the way he was treated in Mersey Beat, Bill Harry's famous newspaper, uh, by the way he was treated in Liverpool, by the fact that kids would camp out on his lawn day and night. Um, he wasn't the most versatile in terms of personality, but he was the best looking. And the girls would go up at the concerts, in various places, including the Tower Ballroom and other places, and try to spread John and Paul's legs, so they could and George sometimes too, so they could see Pete. So it all came to a head in Manchester at the Playhouse when Brian Epstein invited their parents to come on a bus ride to watch them perform. He's very proud of them. He wanted the parents to share, and so all the parents went except Mona, who was nursing a baby. And inside it was a great concert. It was on the radio. And uh, it was in the playhouse. And when they were in this arena, they couldn't get uh, John and George and Paul came out to the bus, but they couldn't get Pete out. So they put Pete in a hamper, a style of hamper that you would take linens in in a hotel. And they tried to get him out of there, but about 50 kids followed them. And one of them took a pair of scissors out, slashed through the hamper, got into the hamper, asked him for a kiss or something, and tried to get a piece of his shirt. And in the process of uh, cutting his shirt, stabbed him with a full laceration. And when he got into the, and he finally got him into the bus, he was he was a wreck. I mean, can you imagine that happening to you? We'd be shaking all over the place. And he was shaking. He was terrified. And the man described to me by everybody I've met in Liverpool as one of the nicest human beings in Liverpool. Uh, Paul McCartney's father, James, mm-hmm. grabbed him by the lapels. And I have four witnesses to this grabbed him by the lapels and said, are you happy, Pete? You've shown up the boys again. Thirty days later, he was gone. And I think that you can pretty well surmise from this book and what I've written in the eyewitness accounts that Pete Best was thrown out of that band for one reason only, and that's because he was, without question, the best-looking guy there. So you don't buy the theory? That change the course of the Beatles. But you have to ask yourself the question. If the Beatles had remained the, the Beatles, would Pete Best in them, would they have failed? Probably not. Wow. Well, you think, well, you think they would have failed? That's so difficult uh, no, to say. I, 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 don't, I don't think they would have and failed. And it might have been, by the way, according to Bill Harry and others, it might have been Pete, John, Paul, and George. That's how popular he was at the time. But, you know, that's the way it was, and that's history, and that happened. And Ringo came into the band. He acclimated very well after a period of time. And he became uh, the focus of a lot of attention. Well, you know, there's so much you can say on this subject. It's hard for me to imagine Pete being as innovative on the drums as Ringo became. Well, he became innovative. He became a great arranger. Uh, he, um, uh, He got a lot of help. In 1970, through his death, John Lennon did a lot of good things for Ringo Starr. A lot of good things. And they all did. Him. What's that? Well, they all did. Well, they all did, but John especially. John became very close in the 1970s to uh, George and Ringo in different ways, um, and very far apart from Paul. And uh, uh, that story has been told. It's not the most beautiful story in the world, but they actually got together more than they, people said they did. Uh, there was some, one time when uh, Paul and uh, Linda McCartney uh, actually surprised them at their place in the Dakota and walked right in. And they did have a lot of laughs. 
And uh, the sadness of it all is that uh, the relationship was so productive and so uh, creative that, uh, uh, you know, familiarity breeds contempt. I mean, a year from now, the two of you may be saying, I think I should have more time than you do on the air. <laughs> then I'm going to have to come and mediate. Well, you can come on any time you want. <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah. Absolutely. Just, so you, you know, it's interesting. Uh, they're, they're, they're really, uh, I mean, for all the blots and problems and challenges and this and that, you gotta, you got to really think about it. John Paul, George Ringo, Pete, Stu Sutcliffe, the really heart of the, the original Beatles, were really amazing people. And um, you got to give them a lot of credit. They conducted themselves well. They put they put out music that is just beyond anything we've ever heard in our lifetimes. And um, every time I listen, I get more amazed. I just got into here, there, and everywhere again. By the way, <laughs> I'd forgotten how good it was. And that's and that's something that's something that happens when you're listening to the Beatles. You sort of forget all these great songs because there's so many of them. Hmm. So you don't buy the 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 theory that Pete Best was fired because he wasn't a sufficient drummer, not and, not even marginally. Well, and, George you know, Martin, you can, you can talk to uh, to uh, Billy J. Kramer, who was there then, mm-hmm. and you can talk to uh, um, Billy Kinsley, okay, who are all there, and they will. You can ask them about Pete's drumming. You can talk to people who saw him drum who witnessed it, like Sir Ron Watson, who will tell you, by the way, and Sir Ron Watson is now a counselor, lawyer in Southport, he will tell you that uh, I don't think anybody saw them more at the uh, cavern than him. We would plunk down his 10 cents and get his uh, really bad uh, hot dog and Coke, and he would watch them. And he will tell you right now that when Pete left the band, it wasn't for the better. Now, Ringo Starr today is obviously a much more accomplished musician than he was. We all grow in life. You know, and I'm not putting down Ringo. He was delightful to be with. What I'm saying is that the history and the eyewitness uh, history to it shows me a much different story than I thought it was. And here's the problem with history. The Egyptians basically uh, wrote their history in uh, hieroglyphics and papyrus leaves. But when the papyrus leaves faded away and died, the history was gone. So it's very easy to rewrite history. If you tell people a story so much, so long, they will start to believe that one way or the other. Now, you know, Mark Lewison, um, the, the, other, the other authors that I have tremendous respect for, may have a different perspective on it, but that's mine. If you had to pin it on members of the Beatles, one or more, who would you pin it on? George and Paul. John said they should have been ashamed of themselves, but he went along with it. John I'm not said saying, that it, by the way, that it was anything vicious. It's what they were comfortable with. And they obviously were more comfortable. First of all, Pete wasn't involved in the same level of uh, social tinkering that they were. And uh, he was much quieter. And he's a moody guy. You know, there's no question about it. But I can tell you that it surprised me a little bit, really surprised me, that when Neil Aspinall died, Yoko Ono was there. Uh, Paul's uh, kids were there. John, George's widow was there. Olivia. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, uh, Ringo's wife, Barbara, was there. But John and Ringo did not come to the funeral, which was a private funeral. And they did pay their respects. Of course they did. Because this is somebody who was very, very important to their lives. But they didn't come there, and Pete was there with the whole best family because Neil Aspinall was a member of their family. And it, it, is it unusual to you that in the 51 years since Pete Best was sacked from the Beatles that the dead Beatles and the surviving ones never saw him again? Ever? Does that mean really, physically, never saw them again? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's that's probably... Me is kind of, that, that being is kind of a provocative issue. Yeah, well, it's probably a very awkward thing for them. Knowing Maybe what is, happened. You know, something had happened. Mm-hmm. And when death happens, people get together. Incidentally, they paid his family upwards of $11 million to cooperate with the uh, Beatles anthology. And, mm. he's hardly, and he's hardly in it. He was paid yeah. how much? $11 million. Okay, well. That was he... Neil Aspinall's final gift. Wow. I don't think I've heard that figure before, but wow. Well, it's debated. But mm. I got it on a pretty good source. 
Okay. How about uh, good old Frida? I assume you've seen good old Frida. Oh, I love it. I love just, it. Uh, the reason I love it is because, I mean, I've seen, I've introduced it at its opening in Philadelphia, and I've seen it so many times, and it's really, I think it's a wonderful story mm-hmm. of a city. I think it's more than just about the people who were there and her role and how loyal she was, and, and extre- extremely loyal. But it's all about a city, and it's all about the people there. And I love the story. I don't know about you guys, but oh, I, yeah, I, I definitely love it too. I was I, very touched by it. Me, yeah, I was also. One one other question by I had. By the way, the Apple organization let them play some music too. Mm-hmm. Yes, they did. That's yes, they awesome. did. In fact, Ringo Ringo's in there, and that that was very cool. Um, interesting that Paul's not in there, but... Um. Well, you know what? I'll tell you the truth about him. Mm-hmm. I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. Uh, but unfortunately, whether we like it or not, he lives in a bubble. And people who are very, very famous live in bubbles. I saw him at the White House a couple of years ago when he was on the Library of Congress, and he gave me this number, and he said, without question, come on, uh, you know, come on... Uh, when I come to Philadelphia in a couple of, in a couple of weeks, I think it was a month later. Let's get together, call this number, and I thought we'd get together, but it never really happened. It was okay though; we had our time there. But he's he lives in his life. It's all about layers, and it's the layers of getting to him. And I don't blame him. Mm-hmm. Look, he had a uh, he had a friend who he created great music with, who uh, had a bad ending, bad ending to his life. And uh, he's very security conscious, and he should be. And so I don't blame him. But what I, I loved the time we, the short time we spent together. One other thing I was going to ask you uh, that I noticed in the book, you were talking about Stu Sutcliffe and his influence on John. And I seem to grab a parallel between uh, Stu's artistic life and what happened with John later with Yoko. Is that accurate? or uh, I, I really don't know. I mean, it's hard to say because Stu wasn't around to see that relationship. But I do believe that John was very easily influenced by uh, art and art forms and people who were different. He loved people who were different. Mm-hmm. And he, because he beat to a different drummer himself. So whenever he saw, like he got, he got very involved with Cesar Chavez and the agriculture movement, farm workers movement, uh, he was for a while taken in by... Uh, Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman, and he he, he got over that. Uh, but he loved new movements. He loved new things. And I can and first of all, Yoko was very very beautiful. Uh, I think that there was a lot about her that he really got into that had to do with art and art forms. And he learned a lot from her. I don't know about Stu's influence, but I can tell you I've seen some of the private letters between Stu and John that that the Sekla family will do whatever they need to do with. And there was a tremendous amount of uh, love and torment in that relationship between two men. And I mean, you know, normal love and torment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Stu Sutcliffe was his muse. He was his friend. And John really, uh, I think, relied on him as a surrogate brother or even a father figure. And, and you've uh, interviewed Yoko, um, oh, yeah. as, have, as have I. And I just want to get your general impressions of her from your interviews with her, because there's a lot, I mean, as you know, there's still an undercurrent of people that think she, you know, that have, you know, misconceptions about her, and I'm and curious she what discourage, she... She doesn't discourage it. <laughs> uh, but I, I actually like her. Mm-hmm. Um, I find her to be a very lovely person. Um, I find her to be uh, uh, very much into uh, her art and her work and her messages. And she's also a great advocate for the beliefs he believed in and the life he led. Um, and I find her to be uh, somebody that's it's a lot. I mean, let me put it this way. I've been with her about four times. And I can tell you uh, she's quite normal. I mean, she's different than a lot of us, but she's quite normal. And I think that, you know, she's 80 years old. And she looks great, stays great. She's got a, a legion of supporters around her. Um, and uh, I believe that she was, I think that Paul's overtures to her were very important uh, because I think there's that thing, you know what I mean, mm-hmm. hanging over both of them, which is kind of sad. You know, it's sort of like a family getting disrupted and the family doesn't know how to figure it out. Um, I like her a lot, and, and I, I'm sure you did too. I mean, I, 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 found, I found her very, um, she has quite an innocence about her that a lot of people don't seem to grab 
at least she did with me, especially the first time I talked to her. She was very, she was very, you know, very nice. The second time wasn't wasn't as she was a little more business like the second time when when I interviewed her. But the all first I know, time she was, made me a drink. That was a non-alcoholic drink made out of some juices mm-hmm. that gave me more energy than anything I've ever had. <laughs> I want that. She gave me that recipe, but uh, she, she's quite quite a helpful, and uh, uh, I, I have nothing uh, nothing bad to say about her because there's nothing bad to say about her, and I think she's done a very good job of. Uh, you know, she buys those ads twice a year, full page ads. War is over, and uh, she really has a, a tremendous belief about. It. Well, you know, the, there's Guys, a lot. There's a lot of people out there who don't really understand her, who don't understand her art, who don't understand what, what John saw in her. But if you really take the time to study her and listen to what she has to say, like you said, Larry, she becomes more normal. Yeah, she really is. All right. Larry, this has been wonderful. Thank you. Ken, thank you very much for thinking of me. So, for things we said today, this is Ken Michaels thanking Larry Kane for joining us. And I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying that was a great interview with Larry Kane. Thank you, Larry. And we will see you next time.